Hi again, everybody, and welcome to the Vermont Climate Council Science and Data Subcommittee. TJ Poor, your humble co-chair, um, and Jared Duval on uh, sends his apologies as the other co-chair uh, wasn't able to make it to today's meeting, but he will be reviewing the meeting uh, video. Today's, uh, today's agenda, um, once we get going, we'll um, just take a few minutes to reflect on the, the work, um, session we had. Um, the agenda calls it a workshop, but really it's extended public comment period that we had on the greenhouse gas inventory last week. Uh, and then very excited to have uh, Dr. Galford and Dr. Posner uh, from uh, UVM and the Guns. Institute, respectively, uh, here to talk about the Vermont Climate Assessment. We'll, um, uh, and then we'll kind of have updates from Task Leads after, uh, after a Q&A session there. Maybe we'll have some public comment uh, on the climate assessment at that time. And then um, kind of look ahead to the next several weeks when we have a lot of uh, work products coming our, coming our way, get updates from Task Leads. Uh, and does uh, does anybody have any comments on the agenda? So hearing none, um, I think we'll move to. You. Yeah, go ahead. Leslie. I said looks good. Thanks. Oh, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> um, and so um, one of the other first things on the agenda is the minutes for June 9th and June 23rd meetings were sent around and should be posted on the AOA website. Is, uh, does anybody have any comments on the minutes? Um, Hearing uh, none, and with a thank you to staff who uh, took those minutes, uh, do, is there any objection to approval of the minutes? Hearing none, we'll assume those are approved. Thank you. Uh, the minutes for for last uh, last week's wor uh, meeting will will um, take care of at the next meeting. They'll be sent around prior to that and posted. Um, so next on the agenda, I wanted to leave some space to uh, for folks to reflect on what we heard um, last week from the extended public comment. And um, I think I'll open the floor to, to subcommittee members who are there who, who may want to comment, if anybody, before I say anything. I have, uh, this is Richard. I have a few comments. Um, I was impressed by how well prepared the people were who came to speak to us. And for the most part, they had cogent arguments and made them clearly. Um, was, you know, it was a, it was a good session. Uh, it was well organized and well moderated. Uh, I think everybody who wanted to talk got a chance to talk at a reasonable length. You know, so all those sort of technical things went well. Um, I, I mean, I have a couple of comments about the substance, um, but I don't know if this is the place for those or not. Um, the, the, in terms of process, um, David Hill was there and I see he's on this call and has some of his staff were there. So presumably they're going to take account of what they heard from the public last Wednesday in making their recommendations about the greenhouse gas inventory which I'm very much looking forward to seeing those. Um, I'm not sure that this subcommittee has really given um, our contractor this, the same kind of detailed technical direction that the public provided at our meeting last Wednesday. You know, TJ and uh, I mean, uh, Jared. Jared and I have each written various emails about tactical aspects of the um, greenhouse gas inventory. Um, there's been various exchanges of emails involving two and three people. 
but this this subcommittee hasn't actually said what it thinks. Presumably we're waiting for the contractor to tell us what they think. Um, and when that happens, we're gonna to have to have a serious conversation about the views of the subcommittee members and the views of the subcommittee as a whole, as informed by what the contractor tells us. But I, you know, I was a bit taken aback, I mean, not taken aback, but, but I just sort of noted that we had a more substantive discussion of the issues with the greenhouse gas inventory with the public input than we've ever had among ourselves. So that's it. Yeah, thank you. I, um, I'll talk about a little bit the process going forward, at least to the extent that I think of it. Um, and we can talk about that in a, in a minute, but I wanna give, um, wanna give Lou a chance, his hand is up. Yeah, thanks TJ. Um, yeah, I wanna echo Richard. Um, you know, certainly everybody there was, you know, really, really well informed and, you know, had really salient points. Um, my, my general perception, not, not having, you know, any particular expertise in this area um, and trying to feel out, you know, what, uh, you know, what, what my feelings are of, of how to proceed in, in this effort. Um, it, it seems that there's, uh, there are a lot of desires for, for how to conduct the inventory, um, you know, above and beyond what's presently done by ANR or by other entities in and outside of Vermont, uh, you know, I guess mainly in thinking outside of Vermont. And so I guess it, it falls to us to determine, you know, you know, to what degree we, you know, continue with that uh, same level of, of not rigor, but of scope. Um, and, and to what degree we actually want to expand, you know, that, that level of thinking. Um, it, it seems to me that, you know, we're, we're excellently positioned to um, be a new voice um, in the state um, for, for what, what is or is not considered um, and, and, you know, provide recommendations accordingly, um, you know, with, with, uh, with the fact in mind that we are in providing recommendations and, and not, you know, setting anything in stone, um, but to provide new precedent for how states could or should consider um, doing greenhouse gas inventory for Vermont and, you know, treating Vermont as a laboratory for the rest of the nation. Um, you know, I don't see that it's, you know, far from what we could hope to do um, by expanding, you know, any potential scope of the inventory. Thank you, Lou. Are there are others on the line. Um, open it up to um, you know staff that were there or um, or others. David, if you had any thoughts um, before I comment. I would just, um, you know, I would say I appreciated the, the structure um, and thought that it was, uh, I have not, I have not been able to participate and I haven't, haven't listened through all of the different meetings, but I, but I thought that the structure was, was helpful and that there is, um, you know, there's information out there on the ways in which you could um, enhance, complement, or change the inventory. I think to to just keep clear our directive from the contract perspective with ANR and with Jane's management of that contract, it would be recommendations for you know potential future changes or enhancements to the inventory. Um, so it's, it's not, um, I don't want folks to think that in, you know, when we come back to the committee, we, we will not have a recalculated inventory, but, um, you know, from a process perspective, data perspective, methodological issues, those types of things, both be able to compare what Vermont's currently doing to other guidelines and what other states are doing and, uh, and be able to reflect on the, the range and the possibilities of, of changes that might be incorporated in the future. But you know, I, I, I think everybody's aware of that, but just just again to restate that it's not a, you know, we're not we're not tasked with coming back with a new inventory at this point. So um, but yeah, I thought that the the discussion um, we have a 
This is Vermont. We're very fortunate. We have a very engaged and very well informed group of people wanting to participate in this, and we should make the best use of it and do the best we can to do that. Thank you, David. And I, I agree and echo what others have said about um, you know the engagement level of folks who participated. I thought it was I thought it was great. I thought it was um, an excellent idea, even if it wasn't exactly what uh, you know. I think Steve Crowley and and George Gross and I know they had worked with a number of folks, but you know suggested, initially suggested, we have an extended public comment period or workshop, technical workshop. And um, I think we, we did a good job in striking a balance of what we could um, we reasonably do in a, in a subcommittee meeting and really hearing and getting good input on uh, other available resources and what we, what we should um, be looking at or directing our consultant to look at um, uh, as a state. And um, uh, so again, yeah, I really appreciate um, all the effort that was put in from the, um, from the public who participated. In terms of process, I, um, you know, I agree, we haven't gone into detail about kind of the finer points of particular issues uh, to, to Richard's point. What we have done is um, had some back and forth through, through emails and then through the, um, through the questions that we had drafted of what we want the consultant to consider. And I, um, uh, and I think there has been some good, um, good, I, I don't want to say discussion, but a good raising of the, those issues. Um, and uh, we've, we've got a breadth, uh, a good breadth and depth of issues that, that David and his team are going to need to, to address in their recommendations. And uh, my, my sense is, and, and folks, please speak up if this doesn't sound right, is that we will get the, the, uh, a draft of recommendations from the consultant, uh, and then we will need to to consider them and discuss them in this in this committee, um, and uh, and then direct the next steps. Whether it's we want X, Y, and Z to happen, or um, you know, or we can make decisions based on it at that time. Um, and uh, well, let me just stop there and see if um, folks disagree with that. And that's a really high level path forward, but um, if folks disagree with that. Great. Um, what did I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and I do, uh, you know, I, I appreciate you, Richard, continuing to bring up the point because we do need to have those discussions. I, I feel like we've been talking for, five months now and um, have kind of touched around the edges of, of substance uh, in the in this committee. And we're really um, going to get to a lot of substance quickly, I think, um, uh, in the next several meetings. So um, Good. Um, I just want to make one quick comment, which is that these sound like technical discussions, but they have world, they have real world implications for what you can expect in terms of uh, greenhouse gas reductions from various pathways. So it's not just a, a an academic discussion. Oh, absolutely. I didn't mean to infer that it was. If I no, I, I know you uh, don't. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I thank you for making that point clearly. Um, great. Well, um, well, thank you all, and and. Thank you again. Uh, for folks that couldn't make it, I do encourage you if you have time to, to um, review the video. Um, there was a lot of good input um, provided. Um, so, so with that, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Galford from UVM and uh, Dr. Posner from the Gund Institute to uh, talk about the Vermont Climate Assessment. And um, I uh, will, would do a terrible job at introducing you. So I will just let you introduce yourselves if that's okay. 
Yeah, um, so I'm Dr. Jillian Galford. I'm gonna share a PowerPoint with you all. Um, Dr. Posner is online. Um, and Stephen, do you wanna introduce yourself before I sort of launch into things? Sure, yeah, I'm the Director of Policy with the Gund Institute for Environment at UVM and I'm assisting Jillian with the Vermont Climate Assessment that she's leading. Yeah, so a little background on myself. Um, I am a research associate professor at the University of Vermont. I sit in the Gund Institute for Environment, um, as well as the Rubenstein School for Environment and Natural Resources. Um, I know a lot of you professionally and personally, so it's great to see a lot of familiar names here. Um, I will give you guys a little disclaimer that um, I've been interacting with various subcommittees of the Vermont Climate Council in two different capacities. So today I'm here um, as the lead for the Vermont Climate Assessment, um, and I'm going to really stick to talking about the Vermont Climate Assessment. I am also part of the team working on the carbon budget um, that was part of the consulting project you guys were just talking about. So um, with David Hill and, and that team. Um, so it's great to hear a little bit of your reflections on that. Um, but I know it can be confusing that I'm interacting in, in two different capacities there. So just to clarify today, I'm really focusing just on the Vermont climate assessment. So my research interests are primarily around land cover and land use change and both impacts that those can have to the environment, um, usually in terms of climate change and emissions from land use and land cover change, as well as thinking about how climate change can impact what we do in land use or how we manage land cover. So kind of going one direction in terms of emissions and sources and the other directions in terms of opportunities for, for mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. Um, so you can see why it's fun for me to think about these issues in the context of Vermont. So I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and introduce you so I'm not going to dwell on this screen except to say that um, our contact information is on this first slide and I will share a version of this um, presentation with TJ to circulate with you all later. Um, I want to start by acknowledging actually a lot of people who are in this virtual room today, um, the co-investigators, the, the really lead members of the VCA include Leslie Ann dupigny Giroux, Joshua Faulkner, uh, Edling, and Paula. The um, research for the Vermont Climate Assessment really comes from the lead authors. Um, and I'll be showing you a lot of work that was done by this long list of lead authors, many of whom you know. Um, these lead authors also coordinated with a number of contributing authors, some of whom are um, all in this room or people who served as uh, subject area experts to review and provide feedback and comment on. Um, and I see some of you are in the room, so thank you for your service and commitment to this product. Um, impacts and opportunities under climate change for Vermont. So covering topics such as our changing climate, forests, fisheries and wildlife, ag and food systems, water resources, community development, energy, recreation, tourism, and public health. Uh, so I wanted to start by kind of saying where my goal today with this session um, and with the VCA in general. So the VCA is really meant to help us as Vermonters understand climate change its impacts and opportunities, um, and to help us make critical decisions. And that can happen at the state level, say in the state legislature, um, all the way down to individual land managers. I'm very uh, curious to discuss with you all how some of these findings or information may be important in the context of your work on the council. So I think we'll have plenty of time for discussion at the end here. Um, I really wanna highlight that um, I understand the, the core mission of the Vermont Climate Council is addressing the green scale from Vermont. Focus on our trend today are some ways in which this is a really complex issue um, that involves social systems and ecological systems and really complex feedbacks and interactions. So we can't just consider um, emissions without considering these, this entire system. 
um, but that also brings some opportunities. And um, I just note here, I'll, I'll bring this example up later, but white-tailed deer and forests, for example. Um, and then complex interactions and feedbacks too among climate impacts. And if you caught, um, I think it was about a week, maybe two weeks ago on Vermont edition, they were up in DMOF, which is abbreviated LDD moth, um, and the interaction of multiple stressors. So part from our current weather pattern um, and part actually from current social conditions. So I live in a part of the state that has just been hit really hard by the LDD moth. The, a lot of the trees are completely deforested. Um, so they thrive during drought conditions we've been experiencing over, in, over the last year. Um, Drought suppresses a natural uh, fungus that can actually control the population number. So we have sort of this climate overplay that is allowing this to. Um, but then the state commented on how the pandemic has actually limited their ability to survey and to potentially use a BT treatment to control the LDD population. And that was related to the pandemic because of the number of people they typically would require to be in a very small confined airplane together. And that was determined not to be safe during the pandemic. So we're having this sort of ecological crisis with the LDD moth. However, there's this complexity of this social um, and, and public health overlay to this ecological stress. So these are the types of really complex issues that we need to be thinking about in terms of climate change. And I'm sure you all are being part of this council. Um, Gillian, if I could um, just so what, interrupt for one second, um, you may sure. you may want to try and turn your video off. We, we've been able to hear you okay, but it's kind of going in and out, and that may help with bandwidth. Your screen has yep. frozen a couple of times, but I think um, we can hear okay. you okay. Yeah, video off probably help. I will do that. Um, for some reason, Zoom is a is a weaker platform for my particular rural Vermont bandwidth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I hope you can hear me. Thanks, thanks, TJ, for saying saying something. Um, yesterday, we also lost power due to a, a dump truck knocking over a power line while grading our roads. So you know, Vermont problems, right? Yeah. Okay. So what I want to focus on today is why do we even do state climate assessments? Um, I want to look at how Vermont's climate has been changing um, and some of the impacts and opportunities for resilience. Um, so these are the types of information we get from the climate assessment, um, which is a huge body of work. And if you haven't reviewed it, I would strongly suggest you do, particularly a chapter by uh, Dr. Leslie Ann focused on the Northeast. But what these um, national and national reports have helped us understand is the role of human activities in driving climate change. You're on the science data committee, so these are probably um, issues you are intimately aware of. Uh, these are graphs just showing some of the, uh, the data that helps us understand human contributions to uh, global climate change. These reports also include information like this graph, which I think is really powerful. I'm going to focus on the right-hand side, the two figures on the uh, top right and lower right. So on the top right, we have observed changes in annual precipitation, um, particularly the amount of precipitation falling in extremely heavy events. Um, so you see all of the Northeast is <laughs> color-coded dark blue with the number 55. Um, and in the bottom, this is the projected or expected changes in annual precipitation falling in very heavy events under the most extreme climate change scenario, which we call RCP 8.5. And again, you can see that Vermont falls in this very dark blue category. Um, so this is really helpful information for understanding how different regions of our country will experience um, and climate change in very different ways. It's not so helpful if you are a decision maker in Vermont, like a regional planning commission, who is trying to consider heavy rain and implications, say, for culverts or road building um, or upgrading, perhaps, particularly when the whole state is color-coded blue. 
if there's one thing I've learned about Vermont, it's that all of us feel uh, that our particular town or even county within Vermont is very unique and has unique challenges, unique characteristics that get different. Presenting ourselves with information that lump all of Vermont into a single category um, isn't the type of detail or information that most of us would want to support decision making. So that's why we set out on uh, the state level assessments. So there's a things that we aim to achieve with the state assessments. Uh, one is credibility. Is, science, is scientific rigor being used um, in the information that we do people trust the credibility of this information? And so the degree of relevancy to the audience. In 2014, we conducted the first climate assessment, which was following pretty quickly on the heels of tropical, tropical storm Irene and a lot of resilience planning for um, floods in the state of Vermont. So certainly talking about too much water was really relevant to decisions uh, that Vermonters were making at that time. Today, we're um, also experiencing drought. So we have to consider the climate variability um, as being very relevant to Vermonters. So things from uh, water. Um, and then legitimacy is really about the process in which this type of assessment is developed how it considers the stakeholders. So in that case, decision makers. This is the way we think about information and information communication. So information comes to us uh, from folks we consider local knowledge brokers. You all are knowledge brokers. Um, you have your own particular contacts um, with decision makers. We work a lot with folks in Samples would be individual farmers. Um, those extension agents, as an example of knowledge brokers, are very well positioned to communicate um, with decision makers. And again, that could be um, an extension agent who testifies in our state legislature about um, change and adaptations that we need to make in agriculture, or it could be that same person talking to a group of farmers. Um, say an annual meeting or such. From a lot of back questions, what they need to know. Um, and, and that's part of the process that we need to really do relevant scope for the state climate assessment. So I'd also encourage you all to really think of yourself as knowledge brokers that um, we would really uh, love it <laughs> if you take up information from our assessment. Um, so that's not just remembering facts and figures, but that's um, using our figures, say if you need to, in a, a presentation or so on. Um, you have your own audience that you can help um, build an understanding of climate change in Vermont. So we um, look for folks like you to translate some of this science uh, to various stakeholders uh, around Vermont. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about how Vermont's climate is changing. Um, this is a recent publication that looks at different emissions scenarios. So considering global atmospheric conditions um, about to 2100, which is a time frame a lot of us like to use scientifically. You'll see a lot of reporting out to 2100. Um, I find even in my own life, it's hard to imagine where in the world I will be 2100. Only about 2030 or 2050. Um, I, I sort of have a vision of, of the world. In 2050, my son will be in his, his 30s. Um, and I can picture that better than I can picture him being in his example. Our mental look out, say, on a time of 100 years. But for us, our lives, we are generally hard pressed to tooth to beyond 20 or 30 years in our time frame. Um, for this reason, one of the, the focal areas of the Vermont Climate Assessment is really looking at historical emissions. So in this figure, the authors have put an orange line in showing historical observations. And we get the 
this from to present or or 2000 to present. Um, that trend line is expected in the models to continue more or less at the same pace, certainly the next decade, if not the two or three decades. And it's when we're getting out past 2050 that we really see more divergent scenarios of climate change. So my point here is that we can look at observations of the more recent past to give us a sense of the coming um, few decades. So it's not um, a model or a prediction or a projection, but it, it helps us at least understand some of the changes that are coming down the pipeline in the near term in terms of um, our climate and how we experience it. So this is going to talk a little bit more in the nitty gritty some of the data that we use for the Vermont Climate Assessment since this is the Science and Data Committee. Um, we used observations from around the state and I really want to point out that Caitlin Crossa and Mahalia Clark um, led this analysis. So they did all the data collection and research um, with the advice of uh, Dr. Leslie Ann Pigny giroux and with um, good input and consultation from the National Weather Service, which for our region is based in Burlington. Um, and we consulted with the National Weather Service because they know a lot about all of these stations. So we were looking for areas that included good geographical coverage of the entire state. So these sites are shown on a map that shows the standard climato climatological divisions of Vermont, Northeastern Vermont, Western Vermont, Southern Vermont. Um, and we were looking for things like data quality and consistency. So there are more available stations than are shown on this map. However, some have long periods with no data collection or um, inconsistent data collection and so on. So the National Weather Service staff was in identifying stations that they considered to have good quality and consistency, as well as a long period of record extending at least 30 years. Um, 30 years because that's sort of the time period we use to def define the current climate. Um, so this next chart, I, I, I call an I not intending to take these numbers and use them as the type of analysis that these authors did. So they look at uh, the trends in changing temperatures and anything on the left hand, the left three columns of this chart in bold with an asterisk means it's statistically significant. Um, so we see a lot of these variables have changed and have changed in ways that we can consider significant. Um, so we're looking at annual average temperatures, but also winter, spring, summer, average maximum, average min, hot days above 90 degrees, um, days above 70, days where the maximum temperature never exceeds zero. So those are cold days and we're actually um, decreasing in the number of cold days, as you can see by the, the blue colors highlighted there. Um, and then warm days above 50 degrees. On the right is the, the total change over that time period. So this is the type of detail you can get from our report. Again, in a presentation like this, I'm not actually expecting you to, to uh, pull away any of these numbers. And instead we have some nice graphs to kind of communicate this information. Um, so, Winter, what have we found? We have found that over time, we're seeing less cold days and more warm days. So on the left, we have the number of cold days. So that's defined as having a maximum temperature below um, zero degrees Fahrenheit. And I should point out that these graphs represent the entire state of Vermont. So they're all the stations pooled together. Uh, the authors have also broken this up by climatological regions. So obviously the Northeast versus the south, um, Southeastern portions of Vermont are, are experiencing slightly different things. But when we look on aggregate, um, the trend is fairly clear for, uh, for all of Vermont. So certainly if we look over the last few decades, we have some much, much fewer cold days. Um, with a note that in the 1960s, that's a period of record that is known to be 
um, a, a notably cold decade. So you can see that shown um, by the high number of, of cold days. So the bar, the horizontal bar here, right at about 30 cold days is the long-term average from 1900 through 2020. Um, and the, then each bar is plotted above or below that long-term average. Less cold days shown on the left. Um, and on the right, we're seeing the average per decade warm winter days. So these are maximum temperatures above 50 degrees. These are, um, you know, I think it was two two or three years ago, I remember in January, we had dinner one night on our screen in porch because it was 60 degrees outside. Those are the, the types of warm winter days that are increasing in frequency. So I, why does this matter? Um, certainly if we think about our forests and potentially accounting for forests and forest management as sequestering additional carbon, um, they're very into our climate future. <laughs> At the same time, um, they are kept well balanced by white-tailed deer, um, which present a growing challenge age. So currently our deer are fairly limited by the winter intensity of Vermont, but expected warming trends are likely to boost deer herd um, and that increased deer herd can do very severe damage on forests and particularly by suppressing forest regeneration. Um, and in places like upstate New York, deer are probably the single most threat to forests, even more so than climate change itself. So today, winter intensity as well as social norms, hunting, um, help keep Vermont's deer herd balanced. At all, we have a fairly deer population in relation to our forest system. So in the future, if climate um, increases the deer herd numbers, we're going to have to think about social and ecological solutions to keep the deer herd in balance if we want our forests to be managed so that they're growing and sequestering carbon. Um, the other thing some of these particularly changes have impacts on our forest uses like timber and maple extraction. So on the left, this is a graph um, from Howland and Wilmot looking in Underhill and the leaf out deep for sugar maples in that region. Um, as the sugar maples tend to be leafing out earlier, we're also inferring an, a, a change in the sugaring season often a truncated sugaring season. Additionally, when we have short winters or winters where freezing conditions are more limited, uh, we are limited in forest harvest or things like timber harvest. And both of these types of activities are really important um, for how we manage carbon storage and sequestration in our forests, as well as providing livelihoods for the people who are um, in charge or making the decisions about that forest and carbon management. So we have to consider both the hoods, the climate impacts and uh, mitigation opportunities that they are responsible for. Um, I wanna to touch on summer. <laughs> We've certainly had some summer, hot summer nights recently. Um, and we see over the last um, few decades that we have had some increases in warm nights. So these are nights when the minimum uh, temperature stays above or above 70 degrees. So that's increasing as well. I think one thing I realized Jared Duvall is not here. I, I put this in expecting he would, would be here as sort of our energy and electricity um, guru, but I know we have some other, other folks from that area as well. Um, so, the complexity of seasonal changes, particularly in electricity um, and energy source demands. So on one hand, we have decreased needs for um, home heating, say in the winter season, but we might have increased demand for home cooling in the winter season. And this, these are um, projections that come from Velco actually. Um, and they're also considering how our electricity sources 
and uses will shift over time. So in this case, um, the they're looking at solar um, heat pumps and electric vehicles potentially changing um, and actually contributing to a net increase in um, peak load despite any of these um, perhaps reductions in, in winter uh, severity over time. So we can't just think of winter severity as being an energy savings, but we have to think about how um, our overall mix of energy and energy uses may shift in the future. An issue I'm sure you all are asking about. Um, precipitation is a really interesting story. So if you've lived in Vermont for several decades, you may have noticed uh, that we are getting more uh, annual precipitation. So we're, we're a better place than, than we used to be. And, and this change from, say, a baseline of 36 per year to something like 44 or 45 um, is as significant as moving from someplace like Chicago to the Pacific Northwest. Um, it really is a, a big change in the amount of water. But it's not just about more water. It's not just about every rain event having a few more raindrops in it. It's really about um, these big, these heavy rainfall events. And so on the right-hand graph, I'm showing the number of what we call heavy precipitation days. So these are days where precipitation exceeds more than one inch of rain. Um, the year of Tropical Storm Irene, we had a lot of these heavy precipitation events uh, the preceding spring, particularly in May and, and such. Um, and the anyway, so the increase in precipitation really in part is attributed to these bigger storms. So we're getting more rain, but we're getting more rain um, in, in really heavy, intense storms. And where does that water go? This is in all our river streams. So this is data um, in our water resources chapter. Um, each one of these, I don't expect you to zoom in and understand all the individual numbers once again, but um, each one of these is a different river. Um, and what is being shown is the mean annual discharge for that river. Um, so each dot on this graph represents the annual discharge for a single year, and overlaid with that trend line and some uncertainty. So this is um, that increased precipitation is also being expressed as increased stream flow in our rivers. We also broke this up. Um, sorry. We, um, each column is season, winter, spring, summer, and um, each row is a different river. So we have uh, the Moose River, the Wells River, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these are, again, the lines are plotted by year from 1960 to, to. I circled in the, the winter season. So every season we see increasing trends in river discharge. Um, except for spring, which is much more variable. Um, but winter is particularly important. And this was something we were asked about by multiple, multiple knowledge brokers during our needs assessment process. Because um, ski areas, particularly downhill ski areas that are dependent or are increasing their dependence on our snowmaking, are required to monitor February mean flow. And typically that was the lowest low during the season. Um, and so their concern is that they not exceed um, the minimum due to their withdrawal. So they're legally bound to this February median flow in terms of how much water they can withdraw or collect for snowmaking. Um, and so far, this precipitation has increased during that winter season and during February, um, which actually means that while the climate remains cool enough to make snow, it all means there's sufficient water in our rivers uh, for those same uh, ski locations to make snow. This is notable because um, the ski industry in Vermont is actually really embraced a green brand and branding Vermont's as a green ski destination. So as you all are thinking about 
there and how we reduce emissions. The ski industry is already thinking about particularly over the last decade by moving to um, on-site energy generation through solar, for example, and different ways to offset their energy consumption on. They look viable for at least downhill skiing and snow draws over the coming few decades. Um, but they might also require more energy use um, if they are pumping and pulling water and doing more snowing. So again, it's a rather complex story. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this, but there's lots of other things we can think of as potentially much more negative impacts of high flows, particularly agriculture ecosystems and things like our infrastructure. Uh, this picture with the houses, for example, it, <coughs> excuse me, I have a sip of water here. Our houses um, damaged by an ice dam that is broken up and just below that fields that were flooded, uh, which can contaminate the crop and actually make it um, have to be discarded. I think I'm going to skip these next two slides. Um, and just again to emphasize this point, this is a USDA data set on agricultural disaster declarations by county. So the count is the number of counties in Vermont that experienced a disaster declaration. On the left is the number of years. And on the right um, is the count per, per county. So, what I want to draw your attention to here are the, the range of things we are encountering in Vermont. So in 2020, um, you know, we, we had several count, all counties, I think, um, some of them multiple times declaring drought in their agricultural um, disaster category. Uh, in 2019, we had frost and, and below cold temperatures. So these are areas where maybe we had a really late frost um, after a really early spring and had extensive damage to crops. Um, in other years, we had heat. <laughs> in uh, other years, we had certainly in 2013, flooding and excessive rain uh, led to a huge number of disaster declarations. A good count there is the number of counties and each county could decrease per year. And that's why there's more, more counties counted than um, counties in Vermont, for example. Um, so really experiencing the variability of climate change between these years where we have extreme excessive precipitation and other years where we have prolonged dry spells and um, even drought as we've experienced more recently. And that's really what we are expecting for coming decades as well is extreme variability um, and an increased uh, extreme, uh, more drought or more excessive precipitation. Um, this is probably one of the most <laughs> uh, used figures uh, or requested uh, statistics from the VCA. So this is looking at the length of the growing is days, I'm sorry, I cut the y-axis, days per year. Um, and these are averaged again across the decades. So the large figure in the center here is across the state, all the stations. And the three pin right show you some of the variability within the state. Uh, so northeastern Vermont on the top, western Vermont in the center, and southeastern Vermont on the bottom, right. notably southeastern Vermont having the most consistent um, and decrease in growing degree days. So these are um, the number of consecutive days without any sort of freeze. Um, this is really important when we think about what trees grow in our forest, what species survive. Um, it's really impacts winter severity or the lack of winter severity. It also impacts agricultural opportunities um, as we see new crops being grown in Vermont that previously were not uh, viable, such as wine varietals, which now you can see driving around the state, um, and, and 
opportunities for extended seasons in agriculture, such as uh, greenhouse cultivated crops during the shoulder seasons. I think uh, looking at again one of those long term areas, thinking about the species composition of Vermont. Uh, we're going to fix of many different species, including spruce, fir, and so on, to a more dominated or even oak pine um, dominated with a reduction in, in some of these other species. So again, thinking not just about how we can impact uh, climate change in terms of mitigation, we also have to think about what our future looks like for climate and how our mitigation strategies perhaps and, um, change really operating space or the parameters by which uh, we understand our, our natural environment. Okay, so um, I really tried to focus on these impacts, but also thinking about these complex social ecological systems and how we seek solutions that address um, not only our opportunities for mitigation, but also how we um, provide for, for livelihoods and for ecological uh, sustainability along this climate change route or path that, that we're on. Um, so again, hopefully you've seen some illustration of how climate change is already occurring in Vermont, some of the opportunities as well as things we need to plan for um, as we, we go forward. So I'm going to stop and take questions. I'm happy to go back and look um, at any particular slide if there's an issue there. Um, but for now, I'll stop sharing. I'm tempted to try my video. Um, but please do tell me if I'm breaking up again and I will turn it off. Great, <clears throat> thank you for that over overview, Jillian. Um, a lot of really, really good work in there. Um, I guess I'll, uh, I'll start just, I, I have a couple of thoughts, but I'll open the floor to subcommittee members to see if they have any questions or reactions. And I'll, I'll start with, um, I, I'm just curious then, um, you broke the state, the climate assessment seems to break the state into three regions uh, there. And I, I'm curious if the underlying data, maybe some of the data supports a breakdown that's significant um, in a more granular level. I know in some of the work with the regional planning commissions that we do there uh, and municipalities they're always looking for data to better understand um, you know how they're how they can adapt to climate change and what's coming and um, I know that that can be very hard with climate data um, so I'm curious um, uh, what granularity there there is yeah, you can certainly look at the individual stations. And TJ, I think that's a really good point. I, those were like the two slides I skipped. Um, but my, what I think an interesting example is, um, you know, I was talking to the Rutland Regional Planning Commission in 2014 or 2015. And at that time, they had gone from experience four to six days of extreme precipitation to experiencing on average 12. Um, and if you update that based on observations from Rutland today, they've had recent years with zero days of extreme precipitation. So they were the station that had sort of the most extreme precipitation in the 2010s. And then later in the 2010s, they had that other, they swung to the other extreme, which most of Vermont did in terms of having very few days of heavy precipitation and in fact having these these dry spells and such that well. Um, so those annual plots of many different climate variables have been created by our team. Um, and I'm actually would be really interested to get your input. We're trying to think the best way to make those available because sometimes you do want to go and look at, um, you know, an individual plot for, for your specific location. Um, Leslie, and did you have a different answer to that question? I saw your um, I camera came on. on. Yeah, she's I was, certainly I was, an expert when it comes to these individual stations. So, 
I, I was going to say that maybe to, to maybe um, help with some of that, there are a couple of, of resources I could probably put in the chat or um, put at some place where some of that has already been put together by folks at NOAA. And you can actually see what your climate change signature looks like at a zip code level. So if you live in 05461, you could actually pop that in and, and see what your, what your climate change, um, both historical and, and future looks like. So um, as soon as I find that, I will pop that into the chat. Right. Thanks. So, yeah, I'm, um, I've looked at weather station data before and found uh, it uh, challenging and always ended up using Burlington because it sounded like the it seemed like the best data. But um, I encouraged to see in your presentation you were able to use more than just the Burlington station. So, so um, which which brought up that question. I, um, I'm not sure the best way to disseminate that uh, to to folks, but the planning commission is probably a good spot to start. So, um, uh, Richard, I think your hand was up. Uh, first. Uh, <clears throat> hi, thanks for that really interesting presentation. I, um, I'm particularly interested in the deer population and its relationship to tick populations and bacterial populations. But um, you've given a lot of thought to public communication, obviously, in putting this thing together. Have you thought, what are your thoughts about communicating the the uh, latent period between when atmospheric gases change and when we see the climate effects. My sense is that we've got something like a 20 year latent period that the full effects of the CO2 that we put in the atmosphere now aren't felt for many years. I mean, it's a, I'm, I'm, I'm a physician by training and the analogy to me is people who say, well, when I start to develop lung disease, I'll stop smoking. Yeah, which, which, which is like I'm, it's like twenty years too late. Yeah, I, I mean, what you're getting at, Richard, is that the greenhouse gases we emit today not only affect um, what we call radiative forcing today, but they affect the Earth for for quite a while. Um, I would really focus on the fact that most of us are starting to already feel the impacts of of climate change. Um, and that for a lot of people is scary enough for them to more seriously think about what we can do to curb climate change um, at, as best we can. And I think, um, you know, when we look back in time, we didn't think of Hurricane Katrina as a climate disaster. Um, but certainly with the historical perspective, you know, we realized that a lot of those um, storms may have been increased in intensity because of, of that. Um, and, and so we start thinking about, you know, the wildfires in the West and a number of other things happening. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think most people relate really well to the information in the Vermont Climate Assessment or Vermonters <laughs> relate well to the information in the Climate Assessment because Vermonters are intuitively um, in sync or attuned to their natural environment, right? We watch the apple trees out our windows and think about, oh, they're blooming or this bird showed up at my house at this time. Um, people really have a, a good relationship with observing the natural world. And, and a lot of them have observed changes. And so when you tell them, yeah, it's because in your backyard, you know, your growing thin has increased by this length of time. Um, it does resonate, and so it, it brings climate change to a much more personal level um, that people have experienced in, in their lives in Vermont. So that's what so, I, I try and focus on. I see. Um, so is it your, yeah. so it, I've lived in Florida for many years and uh, worked in public health in Florida, and we were, when Katrina hit, um, along with the other three hurricanes that year um, in Florida, um, there was scientific disagreement uh, among reputable meteorologists and climatologists about whether the frequency or the severity of tropical storms was increasing because of changes in atmospheric CO2, or greenhouse gases. Um, I mean, pe respected people were actually in disagreement. And that disagreement, of course, was seized upon by climate deniers. Um, but if, if in the intervening yeah, and, and hurricanes. years, uh, we have gotten clear that, that 
hurricane frequency or hurricane severity are in fact, the, the observed changes are in fact being driven by greenhouse gases, that's important to understand and to, dis and to disseminate. Even apart from the mm -hmm. personal observations you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Jay, I noticed you had your hand up. Yeah, great work here. I appreciate the perspective on the forests and some of the seasonal and uh, kind of more asynchronous factors as things change. Uh, you know, I approach this a little bit more from the weather side. Uh, Richard, to your point about hurricane activity, I think there's overwhelming evidence that the intensity of, of hurricanes, uh, as ocean temperatures get warmer, that intensity potentially goes up. Um, no, I, mean, I understand that that it that appears to be established fact now, but in 2004, yeah. when Katrina hit us, it wasn't as well established as it is now. Yeah, that's correct. Um, just want to make sure we're clear on that, um, what the science says on it. Um, so, and also just connecting the dots to uh, Jillian, I contributed a figure related to power outage impacts to the energy trap chapter on the Vermont climate assessment. So that's still forthcoming in there. Um, Yes, I almost put that figure into the. <laughs> yeah, so I uh, just want to make sure that uh, there's a communication channel that's still open with some of the work that's ongoing with, uh, you know, kind of my purview with the utilities. We have higher resolution analysis that's on a five kilometer grid. That's 40 year trends, not quite going back a century, but we created a, you know, re simulated a data set there that might be helpful for that. Um, I guess the big question here really is, and maybe it's more of a discussion and things that we're trying to reconcile is the future. We're basing a lot of, of you know, the future forecasts off of trends, which is okay. It's a fine method there, but is there anything else in the climate assessment work that is pulling in any sort of climate simulations or other literature uh, looking ahead beyond just kind of a trend line? Yeah, that, that's right. And a, a good disclaimer on our part that you know, we aren't a team of, of global climate modelers or, we're, or we don't do downscale climate modeling. Um, unlike the, uh, there was a state climate assessment out of Connecticut, which was led by a, a team of, I think it was six atmospheric scientists, right? So their whole objective was to do better climate downscaling for the state of Connecticut. Um, that was not within the purview of, of this exercise, um, but I think it's something that we should Think about there is some work that's come out of UVM um, led by Brian Beckage's group. Um, Leslie Ann, I'm not sure if you were involved in, in that as well. Um, the so anyway, there there is some work there, Jay, but I, I think um, yeah, there's there's a lot more that could be done in Vermont and particularly to make that data really accessible, um, you know, and, and more rapid turnaround on it instead of our sort of traditional academic approaches that often mean it takes us many, many years to get something out. Yeah, yeah, so to two follow-up points to that. We we did run two downscale climate simulations with RCP 4, 5, and 8, 5. And uh, we're working on that, but we can't rely on it. It's, it's a really complex thing to do and we only had a really small team to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but there is some at least directionality from the seasonal signals that we're intending to show 30, at least 30 years ahead, not quite a century ahead with this. So that could be helpful um, to come okay. into this work. I'd love to talk with you more about that. Yeah. yeah, so we should perhaps just connect on all those levels there. Um, and, and then just mm -hmm. the, the higher resolution stuff, the season, the regionality of it, you know, how tight can we get with future projections? We, obviously the town level is really a place where it's probably um, too perfect and there's too much uncertainty to get it quite that level. I think we just, we all need to understand that, that we're not gonna quite get that level looking ahead on the climate, um, right? Yeah. Right. I remember Leslie and, and um, I think it was around the time of Tropical Storm, Irene was getting questions like, why did this river valley get this much precipitation and the next one over only got that much precipitation, you know, and there's each big storm event brings so many unique factors that are not going to be captured next necessarily in those climate projections. And, and just to piggyback on a couple of the last two or three um, points that were made, um, to go back to something that you raised, Richard, 
part of why we're seeing some of that increased understanding now is because the more events that you have, the more data that you have, the more you can actually do a lot of attribution studies and have more confidence in them. So that's what you're seeing part of that in there, the understanding and the physics sort of improving over time. Um, and and to, to go back to, to your point, Jillian, about that um, temporal and spatial variability and the need to actually to the best that you can have that finer scale information for as long as you can. So you can actually have the, the best sort of um, understanding of what's going on. So I promise to, to just pop that into the chat here. So let me see, TJ, can I share my screen just one sec? Sure. Okay, let's see here. Can everybody see this okay? So- Yep. What, what are you seeing? Seeing your uh, climate explorer here in the number okay. charts. Right, so that, that's a NOAA-based tool and it looks like this. And all you do is you put your zip code in and what it does is it pulls up information on, um, you know, the, the, the tr trends back through time. It pulls up information on, on the projections out through future. So RCP 4.5. 8.5 and then you can sort of delve a little bit deeper into some of those historical thresholds and then if you wanted to actually look at, at uh, longer term pieces of, of the weather you could also do that so um, it's called the climate explorer that it's it's one of the the NOAA products that's out there that if you haven't seen it before you can poke around and take a look at it great thank you I I have two more, or maybe it's one more question for you, but um, I, so, you know, as the science and data subcommittee of the council, one of the things we're trying to do is identify data gaps and needs um, that we can improve upon in the future, even if it takes some time. So I, I'm curious if what you would say you need to better um, enhance the climate assessment, enhance, uh, you know, better predict impacts of climate change, uh, aside from more weather or climate events, <laughs> perhaps. Um, but um, what is there, is there anything we can do or you would, you would look for recommendations on um, you know, for us to consider on what we could do better and then on the other side of that i guess it's how how should we best use this information here um it seems like there's a lot of adaptation potential and understanding so mm -hmm. that we can make adaptation recommendations but maybe there's there's other uses um, of the data yeah so most of the vca focuses on adaptation and mitigation um, by each of those sectors so whether it's ag and food systems or forests or so on <clears throat> or energy. Um, so considering the impacts of climate change, opportunities for mitigation and for adaptation. Um, and again, that focus a little bit more on the sort of 20 to 30 year time scale because that's really where we see people making decisions and able to relate. It's where we see our legislature, right, like putting into place agricultural policies that will, um, will last 20 years or, or so. Um, so that's been our focus. I do think a limitation is um, some of the climate modeling and, and such. Um, I, do, I would sort of defer to, to Jay and Leslie Ann though, in terms of like, is that, what is that in terms of a rank priority order, you know, and, and what is the value added um, compared to the resources that they've mentioned that are, are already available? Um, I would put on another hat, which is thinking about how we assess emissions. Um, and I, I think that some of the data limitations there um, are, are real, you know, so traditionally we haven't necessarily accounted for agricultural land management practices that are actually sequestering carbon. Um, and part of that is that the, the sort of statistics, right, the reporting numbers on that are hard to come by or hard to come by on an annual basis. Um, and there's often a lag between things like um, when an official data set is cleaned and ready to go. Um, and so if I'm looking at information that's four or five years out of date, whereas the information I was able to present to you guys today on climate, you know, we can 
you can say like, hey, I'm gonna go to the most recent calendar year and that, that information is out there. Um, so I think sometimes those lags may, I, I would anticipate could hinder some of our ability to really assess the effectiveness of certain programs. Um, and, you know, we're seeing really big shifts. I was hearing the other day, like we've increased cover cropping by 30% in the state of Vermont, um, but our current census data hasn't caught up to that yet. You know, so how do we kind of account for those things that shift really quickly, um, but more official records um, are a little bit sparse in time. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah. So um, I know we're, we're coming up on a, uh, what is scheduled in the agenda as a break. I want to open the floor before we do that to if there's any uh, members of the public that want to um, chime in, um, add some perspective, or ask, ask Jillian a question. Uh, Jay, Steve. this is this oh, is go, sorry. Go this is this is David Hill. I I need to drop off, but I just wanted to thank Jillian and everybody else for the discussion and presentation um, today, and uh, look forward to talking with you all more soon. Great, thanks, David. Uh, Steve, you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what a fascinating presentation. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering about you know the. Looking at the the last few weeks and the you know the heat bomb in the Pacific Northwest and last you know the the cold in Texas and it seems like those are related to these oscillations of the jet stream and everything that are sort of the climate system being uh, you know thrown out of whack somehow uh, in ways that weren't predicted by earlier climate models or climate assessments. Um, is, is what, what is your, I'm just curious what your perspective is on that, uh, as we go forward. And I know it's hard, it's inherently hard to predict. So, so I'm just curious about your thoughts about all that. And does it, does it relate I, um, to Vermont in any way or what, how should we think about that? Well, I think it does relate to Vermont because when we look at things like the IPCC, who certainly is the definitive, you know, scientific resource on global climate change and, and global change rate large or uh, the US Global Change Research Program, right, we understand in really broad strokes what is happening with climate and it's things like we hear number two degrees of warming across the whole Earth's surface. Um, and that's kind of hard to relate to. Like, do you really know if it's 87 or 89 degrees yesterday? Like, it just feels hot, right? Um, and two degrees is kind of hard, hard to relate to. Um, however, when you hear that, like, in Vermont, we're increasingly experiencing warm days in the summer or per, in particular warm nights, um, you know, it, it starts to relate a little bit more to your personal experience. And I think that... Um, brings all of that a little bit closer to home. So, you know, these, these averages and these global trends miss some of the variability that you're talking about, Steve, right? The, the, the extreme events um, that we are experiencing more. And I, you know, Leslie, I could probably do a much more eloquent job of, of describing why some of these um, heat domes or the vortex set up and, and such, but they are related to our jet streams um, and changes in our atmosphere that, you um, that are driving those events. So we're seeing more variability and something like talking about changes in average temperature actually um, sort of mathematically get rid of these really high, you know, these big extreme events like really heavy rain or really hot um, temperatures. Um, so when you average those in with everything else, it looks like, oh, two degrees of, of warming globally. Um, but the reality is, you know, I it was 116 or something in, in Oregon, you know, and, and this time of year, I used to live in Oregon, is usually when you go to the Rose Festival parade and it rains on you, you know, so it's, um, it's a really big change. It's not just that little incremental change. Leslie Ann, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, and I, I see Jay just popped something in the chat as well, and, and, and part of it um, also goes back to time, and the improvements in, in, in models, improvements in um, 
the resolution of the models, improvements in the physics in the models, the equations that are being used and better able to actually capture a lot of the, the physical processes and dynamics of what's taking place in the Earth atmosphere system. And how does that play out in terms of the model outputs that come along? So the, the more that we go along, the, the better the models are, the better the output actually is. And so it looks like um, things were wrong in the past. It's just a question of things being better resolved and better understood. And so um, as we go on through, you know, we could, we're going to continue to see those improvements in, 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 in the science. And so um, Jay does a lot of this as part of his bread and butter. And so he's probably seen, I mean, I've seen some of this in, in my 24 years here in Vermont in terms of you know, explaining some of this sort of stuff. And, and I know Jay's probably seen that in time that he's been, you know, teaching at, at, at Lindon in, in, in looking at how some of these model outputs actually change over time. Yeah, and I, I might just add, um, I, reflecting on that question, Steve, I'm reminded of what Jay, you put up on the screen a few meetings ago with that balance of kind of the risk of events happening or changes in, you know, our, our land or climate happening and the impact of them in terms of this width of the circles and kind of that, that little matrix and how we think about that going forward as a, as a subcommittee um, in how we weigh our mitigation solutions and how, and how the council as a whole weighs the mitigation solutions and, and the um, the impact of those solutions, I think, is really important, and, and I'm not sure how to best articulate that in the climate action plan. Um, and I think, I think Jay will probably be able to do a good job of doing that. But um, you know, in in given your comment in the chat and what you've said before, but I do think all of that is is related. And as we see these events nationally, how they apply in Vermont, and then how they how we articulate that as considerations in our in our adaptation and mitigation planning going forward is all uh, um, really important and, and something we need to get on paper here in, in the near future. Um, Mark, you can have the uh, last question and word before before we take a break. Thanks. Well, I, I hate to be the guy standing between everybody and the break, but uh, uh, here, I, here I am. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you very much for last week's session. Uh, many of the, uh, the state-sponsored sessions, information sessions, or uh, input-gathering sessions that I've been to have been more theatrical events that have been required by statute or uh, rule. And that was not the case last week. It wasn't a, uh, it didn't seem like a theatrical event and it didn't seem like the gong show, which uh, is often the case. You know, you get your three minutes and the gong goes off and you, you get the hook. Um, there were some interesting discussions and I, I for one appreciated it very much. Um, Jillian, I wanna thank you for your presentation today. Uh, it was very interesting, very well done. Um, I'm most interested in uh, um, land use and land use management as, a, as, a, as climate action. It seems to me that uh, we in Vermont have very little influence over global concentrations of greenhouse gases, but we have a tremendous yeah. amount of influence over the way our lands are used and uh, the things that we can do to uh, increase carbon uptake and sequestration. And I, I would like to see more emphasis placed on that uh, by, the, by the climate. Of course, the underlying legislation uh, emphasizes mitigation and emissions reduction, you know, which, which is kind of ironic because that's the thing that we on a global scale, we have the least amount of influence over. Uh, but I want to thank you for your presentation. Thanks, Mark. I think you bring up um, an opportunity to mention one point that I, I don't think the state has thought about very much. Maybe you all do as individuals. Um, but it's an issue in carbon sequestration we call additionality. So if, if we did no 
additional management, our forests in Vermont would continue to grow and sequester carbon. Um, they are relatively immature forests. That is, we don't think of them as being in a steady state in terms of exchanging carbon um, in and out with, with the atmosphere. Um, because of our agricultural legacy going back at least 150 years when most forests were um, it sort of sprung out of agriculture that was abandoned, we have a relatively young forest that hasn't reached its state of maturity. So in most places in the world to actually count carbon sequestration in your forests, you have to think about that growth and what you can actually attribute to your activities is the additionality on top of that. So what management activities are we using that actually increase our carbon sequestration? If there's sort of a background rate of carbon sequestration, what is our additional amount? Um, and if you look at global, um, carbon credits, trading schemes, things like that, they would really require us only to account for that additionality in terms of crediting, crediting ourselves with mitigation. My understanding, um, and TJ, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the in Vermont, we're actually counting sort of background carbon sequestration of the forest and the additionality, not just the additionality. Um, so I think that that's something, um, Mark, I, I think we should take a strong look at if, um, you know, right now we're not obliged to, um, is my understanding, but you know, if we want to think about how we fit in the global context, that may be something we need to account for um, in the future. In terms of how we increase our carbon sequestration in forests, which I think was part of your question, there's a lot of work going on um, about that. We try and highlight a lot of it in, in the VCA, um, but there's different ways uh, to manage even your forest timber harvest that actually enhances sequestration of carbon. Um, and a lot of times it actually also can help increase habitat for songbirds and other species. Um, so it can, it can have other co-benefits. It can be profitable, um, it can increase carbon storage, and it can help the overall ecosystem. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in that area at UVM. Um, I can point you to more resources on that as well. Yeah, thank you. And I, I can, it's interesting um, point because I, I, I could let um, Colin speak to the inventory and how it accounts for it, but in our uh, leap modeling of um, pathways, we're assuming that the amount of sequestration is following a recent trend of actually declining over the last uh, decade plus um, the amount of sequestration. And so that is related to our land use change, more recent history of land use changes, I, I think. And, um, and it brings some to the for something that Jane has said and others have said, you know, if we're just going for net energy zero or net zero by 2030, that's, that's actually an easy target, relatively speaking, an easier target to hit because of, um, you know, our landscape where we do have lots of forest, but um, if we're really looking to mitigate as, our, as we're required to um, in certain energy sectors or non-energy sectors, then that's a, that's a different ask. Uh, you know, eventually by 2050, we'll be um, net negative uh, in terms of our emissions uh, in order to reach our, our goals. Um, so uh, I think I think with that, um, thank you again, Jillian, um, very much appreciated. And um, I, I'm glad you're going to be a resource wearing your other hat as well. And, and we have uh, Leslie Ann on the committee too, who I know can uh, uh, get a hold of you and, and Jay is doing a lot of great work here too. So I think this was an excellent uh, presentation and discussion, so thank you. And, um, so I said there's a break on the schedule. Uh, I, I think I've been advised that our meetings are, are long enough that we should really be, um, for everybody's sanity, taking a break in between. This meeting it was originally scheduled to actually adjourn at 3.30. So I'm not sure if uh, I, I'll, 
I'll look for uh, votes from the subcommittee members, whether we should take actually take a break or we should just plow ahead. So if you want to take a break, raise your hand. I see nobody raising their hand. So, okay, let, let's, uh, let's go forward. Um, and um, you're a good boy. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think you were talking to me, Brian, but, but perhaps uh, that. Yes, I was, TJ. Yes. You're doing a great job. But... <laughs> uh, recorded in, uh, in for all of history. Okay, so. Uh, what we have next on the agenda is to go over the um, task, the tax plan. Um, sorry, our work plan um, by the task leads. And um, what I sent out to sub subcommittee members was a uh, is titled version 1.2 with yesterday's date on it. Um, had some updates that were attempting to reflect um uh where where we actually are um these i i did most of these i had some input from jared on some of them but um i think i'm gonna pull that up on my screen for us to talk through if that works um Okay, um, can folks see my screen here? I'm not, I can't see anybody else, so not we hearing. We can, Jared, uh, TJ, excuse me. Yeah, and thank you, Lou. Um, so first task here, uh, the greenhouse gas inventory task. Um, we had on the, on, uh, the agenda for you know, originally it was for next week. Remember this was done six, eight weeks ago when we weren't sure when things were gonna happen um, to finalize some draft recommendations for the council, prepare a PowerPoint and that do next week. We're not, we're not there yet. Um, and so what I just drafted in here is to see if the consultant has any, and unfortunately David had to leave, it has any draft recommendations uh, next week, we would be able to review and discuss them then. I'm not sure if that's the case. And um, I guess I'm, I'm not sure if you'll know, Richard, but I'm going to look to you to see if, if that makes sense or if that's a little premature. I don't, if you're addressing me, I don't think I understand the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, you know, what we have on this work plan is kind of what's going to happen next week. And I had, I guess the question is, is the timing, do you know the timing of the um, consultants recommendations offhand? Uh, you know, if we're expecting something. I have no idea. Discuss? Okay. Um, all right. So, what I'm going to say is this is a maybe here, but really the next steps uh, are in the greenhouse gas inventory is what I had mentioned earlier. Um, actually, before I before I close this one, I, um, Colin, are you still on the line? I'm not sure if you are, and you may or may not know the answer either. So I, I apologize for putting you on the spot um, to the timeline for the consultants recommendations here. Okay, I'm gonna assume that Colin is actually not still here then. I would look at the contract. Right, it, we could do that. I didn't have time to do that, but I just wanted to see if, if folks who have been working on, uh, you know, I know there's been a kickoff meeting with the consultant and if, uh, if we had this offhand um, to kind of figure out our work plan and when we might be able to, to do this. 
Um, I, I do know that work is happening soon and you know, it, this could happen either next week or the, or the week after. They probably did say, and it, I'm sorry, but it's not at the top of my memory. Right. Uh, not, not a problem. Um, I, I do know that there's, so this is going to be the case with the social cost of carbon task group as well, that there's recommend the, you know, they're going to have a report towards the end of the month, a final memo with some recommendations on a, on a path forward. And so um, I think that the draft of that is going to, to be the kickoff point for our discussions. And um, we will, uh, I guess, you know, I, with Jared, I'm leading the social cost of carbon group and Jared and uh, Richard, I think the two of you are on the greenhouse gas inventory group. Um, you know, we can update this uh, as we as we get a little more resolution when that will be be here. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip the carbon budget because Brian wasn't able to be here, and I'm not sure that. Um, anybody else knows uh, has an update there. I'll try and work with them to update the timeline for when we can uh, when we can discuss that in committee. Uh, and I'm going to just skip down to the climate. What's in this um, work plan as the climate data impacts and modeling and um, talk to that as the human and health and combine that with human and health impacts. And Leslie Ann, you popped up on my screen. I think I'm gonna turn it to you because I know you and Jay and, and Richard, I believe have done some work in this area. And I can pull up a different document if you'd rather. Yep, TJ, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the one that um, Jay sent you early, I think Jay had to pop off for, for family reasons, so. Yep. Um, it is coming, I think. It's not showing me the correct one here. Can you see this now? Yep. Okay. Okay. I'll try and make it bigger if that helps. No, I just like doing that to my screen. All right. Uh, tell us what you're thinking, Leslie, and or what your group was thinking. All right. So we had a, it's supposed to be a quick meeting. Um, earlier today with, with trying to get our heads wrapped around some of the various pieces around um, how climate change projections and modeling fit into some of the other pieces that I had um, showed the last time we met. You know, that nice diagram talked about do no harm and all of the various governance and planning and all those pieces in there. And so um, what we tried to do was to collapse some of that thinking all into a framework that um, helps us to, to think about how to, to bring these pieces in place. And so a lot of that is folded into that row nine where you've got thinking about um, modeling our, our future climate change, looking at the ways in which land use and land cover are critically important to how we think about both mitigation and adaptation. Some of the, the governance pieces um, we heard earlier today and also knowing how challenging it is to, to work at a town level, given the resources that um, towns have in place. How do we bring some of those um, governance issues, some of those planning issues to bear? And then the ways in which um, agriculture, as well as food systems play into all of this, the, the, the understanding that one in three Vermonters is, is currently not food secure. How does that um, affect some of the things that we're thinking about? And then what are some of these other human dimensions um, that we are, are going to be sort of paying a close eye to using that as, as a lens. So the folks who are currently working on this in this, this group 
uh, will probably grow include Jay, uh, Lauren, Chris, Abby, and, and Catherine Dimitruk. And what we try to do is to think about strategically how to bring some of this to bear. And so today, um, thank you, Jillian, for the presentation on some of the pieces and the elements of, of the Vermont Climate Assessment. Um, one of the first things that we're going to do following this is to, to really create some common terminology around some of these issues and challenges so that we're all working from the same place. Because if you look at the expertise on, on this particular group, we're coming from a number of different but overlapping areas. And so that's, that's going to be critically important for us. Um, Jay put into the chat um, some state funded work that just came out. Great story in Vermont Digger on that. And how do we bring that together with some of the other pieces that we can look at from um, some of the resources that um, I'm, I'm able to bring from a, a NOAA perspective that drill down to um, local, local scales in, in this particular space. And so uh, we have to talk about how we're gonna do that. So we purposely did not put a lot of granular information in some of the weeks going out in time, but we will be working towards filling out some of those elements um, along that particular row in here. And so um, part of that was uh, in conjunction with, with Richard in, in looking at some of those human health um, pieces. I know we had a quick uh, email exchange on, on Friday on, on where we are in terms of that. And so Richard, if you wanna say anything on that, but before you do, um, just looking at my email here, um, Jared and I were just going back and forth, Jared Elma, that is, because he's also on the Vermont um, Drought Task Force, which I helped activate. So we had our first meeting yesterday. So Jared was on that because yeah, he fills that role as well. And so we're going to be going back and forth with how does the Department of Health sort of um, bring some of that expertise to, to bear in this particular space. So um, Richard, did you want to say um, some of the pieces that you had raised last Friday? Sure. Um... My interest is complementary to what Leslie Ann has been talking about. Um, and, and I really don't know how this fits into the existing contract with, with Cadmus and its subcontractors um, or into the Department of Public Services approach. But my interest is in perhaps trying to estimate the health impacts of various decisions we might make about methods to reduce greenhouse gases. So this has to do with the health impact of our response, not with what we're trying to respond to. Okay, so it's complementary. Um, and you know, if, if the result of an effective greenhouse gas um, control strategy is to reduce uh, airborne particulate matter, then there are health specific health benefits that would be expected from that, that are not about global warming, they're about particulate pollution. And if, uh, if an, uh, the result of another strategy would be that people use, people walk more or ride their bicycles more um, as a result of the strategies, then there are health benefits to that as well. And Jared Ulmer is really very sophisticated about how to model these things. He also is only one person and can't really do it himself. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, uh, yeah, I suppose he could be assigned the work by his supervisors, but that hasn't happened. And um, so I, I, this, uh, this is not the central issue with the climate plan that the council needs to develop, but if it were possible, perhaps in a second iteration to estimate the health impact for good and for ill of the control of the prevention measures, the control measures, that would be, I think, a good thing. Yeah, and I um, think I agree with you. And I think there's um, maybe two, two phases to that. I wouldn't, I'd be cautious about pushing it off to the second iteration completely, uh, at least the, the part you're talking about, Richard, um, you know, from the Department of Public Service and the, uh, the modeling with the, uh, the LEAP modeling that we're doing, we're, we're going to get to economic modeling. Um, and that's where kind of the consultant can come in and, and ensure that we're quantifying at least in some way, some of these health benefits um, from the energy plan perspective that, you know, this is one of the policy trade-offs we wanna try and elevate and articulate and make transparent that, 
hey, each each solution here has um, a different cost benefit and the way you count and what you count for those benefits are really important to what you might devote limited resources to. Um, and, and we know that the answer isn't zero. So if we just assign it zero, then we know that we're wrong. We might not know exactly what the, the right number is, but we can start to go in that direction of, of that there is a value here. We should, even if we have a large band of uncertainty, we should be assigning something to it because we, you know, we know that's probably wrong too, but we know, you know, there's a chance that it might be right if we assign something to it. We know the zero is wrong. And so, um, it's definitely top of mind for for me in that energy plan work, which overlaps with the climate council's work in terms of the modeling and the economic um, impact uh, analysis. So, um, and and then uh, speaking more broadly, I guess to Leslie Ann, what you were saying, I think um, this is you know. I understand throwing everything into these cross-cutting systems kind of task group where you're you're addressing a lot of stuff. I, I'm concerned a little bit for you that you're throwing a lot of work into into one task group because there's there's so many interactions and so many um, different pieces to that that um, I I just um, it, you'll. I don't know. I, you'll have to be careful to make sure you're not um, just kind of glossing over anything in terms of get uh, you know while getting everything, addressing everything. So I, I I hear you, TJ, and that's why the group is 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 blooming here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. Um, I'm just gonna scroll to the right here. Um, so. Um, I can't recall if you put in this for the common terminology for climate, climate change adaptation. adaptation. Um, so you'd be looking to, um, uh, by the end of July, um, actually, sorry for moving around so much, um, get to that terminology uh, and, and maybe have a discussion here in this committee about that. needed to unmute myself here. Yeah, so give, given the fact that this is less than a couple hours old, um, it's, it's the usual. So we need to sort of flesh this out and then really get the specific task in there. But we wanted to have a placeholder um, instead of having just a completely blank line. So more to come, right. stay tuned. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, I mentioned social cost of carbon, uh, just to update on that, um, the task group met with a consultant to, to discuss this. We had the questions that have, you know, this committee has seen maybe a month ago um, that we had teed up that we want the consultant to answer on uh, the social, how should we value carbon mitigation, carbon emissions? There's a, several questions there. They're going to review the methodologies that are available. We did decide in the subcommittee that we don't want to create something new. We're going to review the literature that's out there uh, and then uh, set up a path for determining a discount rate to be used because the discount rate is one of the main assumptions in the social cost of carbon that really can change the, change the value dramatically. Um, you know, we, we talked about it in the committee and I think we've talked about uh, or we talked about in the task group, I think we've talked about it in this committee, uh, you know, recent era um, discount rates used by the federal government were in on the order of 7%. And then that ultimately created a very low social cost of carbon. You know, the carbon wasn't worth much to society, carbon reductions um, under that scenario. And, um, you know, if you bring it down to what, previous federal administrations had in the two or 3% range, you have a much different look and how you value things. And 
and it goes back to the modeling and the economic analysis. But it, this, you know, if we're valuing these reductions to Vermonters, um, we we need to understand how to value that with a, you know, the appropriate discounting of of future versus present. And uh, to that end, it. It's my understanding that consultants going to do survey council members to kind of get a better understanding. So get them up to speed on what it is, what it means, and then um, survey council members on what they think it would be an appropriate discount rate to use um, and uh, in a social cost of carbon um, value. Um, our committee would then need to discuss those results discuss the methodologies that were are put forth in a report towards the end of the month. Um, any questions on social cost of carbon? Okay. Um, the leap modeling, uh, it's not here, but uh, the leap modeling, I'll just um, say is uh, we should have a mitigation pathway um, internally the end of the week. I'm, I'm not sure if it'll be ready for next week to share with the committee. I'm hopeful so that um, is hopefully on the agenda next week to, to show um, revisions to the business as usual from the feedback we've gotten plus, and the um, you know, a mitigation pathway on, you know, given this set of assumptions, we could meet our targets and these are what the assumptions would be. It may be next week, it may be the week after. And then the, the last one I wanted to cover here um, is the develop monitoring and assessment strategy. And this one, um, as far as I know, nothing has happened here. There's a lot of folks in parentheses that are um, you know kind of half half assigned or half uh, meant to to de delegate to others um, you know to lead this, but I will I wonder if um, in the time we have, if folks, we could have just a brief discussion about what what people mean by this, so that we can um, just start to. Um, start to flesh this out a little bit and then and then take a um is for future discussion um, and scope this out what what i think of so i'm going to pull the screen down now so i can see other black squares instead of the spreadsheet um Develop monitoring assessment strategy is what I think of is how are we gonna how are we gonna track um, what we're doing? How are we going to um, it, monitor in the in the future what we um, well? How are we gonna track our progress to meeting our goals? What do we need? Um, what do we need and uh, to do that? What data are we missing? And then how are we gonna how are we gonna get it and track in the future? Um, that's a really simplified scope, um, but I do think it's important. And the last thing I'll say before I open it up is I think the next step after a climate action plan is for agency and natural resources to put rules in place. Um, and I mean, in what I imagine being part of those rules are, um, are the mechanism to actually measure our progress and keep keep going uh, going forward, monitoring how we're doing. So that was very ineloquent, but um, I think you get my point. I think I got it all out and um, folks want to chime in, that would be great. So in, in addition to that, TJ, um, part of, of thinking about monitoring as separate from maybe data gaps and, and those sorts of strategies is um, when, when we're thinking about how well we're doing, it may be a little bit easier on the, the mitigation side, but maybe less so on the adaptation side. So I just wanted to put a pin in there for when we're thinking about um, our responses, that we're thinking about them as broadly as possible and all of the ways in which things could possibly change and, and how do we track whether 
if something is actually making a difference or not. And so um, just kind of broadening some of the pieces that, that you just looked at. And, and, and then I'm going to put my other hat on. And when I think about tracking changes and monitoring, I also think about um, different methodologies for doing it. Um, so inventories are one, but are we also going to be looking at things like um, changes on the landscape? How are we going to be quantifying that? Are we going to be using different types of information, whether it's geospatial or otherwise? And so I think, um, again, putting a pin on how we look at, at this, broadly speaking, is, is, is part of that challenge. And, and given the fact that we're at dwindling numbers here, um, and given the fact that a lot of folks are on vacation or um, not with us, um, I think the third pin is to maybe revisit that when we have more folks who either signed up for this, but also more folks who um, are supporting it from a staff perspective or have expertise in, in this realm. I kind of feel like we're, we're, we're going this way in terms of our numbers, in terms of our expertise, and everybody's like, oh, I'm going on holiday, and you know, and so, you know, how do we make sure that we um, honor our folks' um, need for rest, but also honor the expertise that they bring to the table. Yeah, um, thank you for that, Leslie Ann. I um, I noticed the the dwindling numbers also, but at the at the same time, didn't want to lose it uh, because you know to the extent we're talking about standing up a data platform or this is a state data project. Um, I think folks are aware that those uh, those things take a long time. Um, and so I just don't want to lose that and come back in three months and say, oh, yeah, we got to figure, a, you know, evaluation and measurement and verification strategy and uh, it not be there. So happy to put a pin in it, but um, want to keep it on the agenda. Absolutely. Just I'm just looking at the, the folks who are involved, and I would say two of us out of the eight are here today. So, right. Okay. Um, any other? Uh, so next, the last thing on the agenda is uh, just updates from uh, liaisons uh, from other uh, committees subcommittees of the Climate Council and uh, what might be happening. I think, um, well, we'll just leave it out there. Right. Does anybody have any updates from other committees? Hearing none, I, um, I, I will just say that um, for subcommittee members, it may be worth looking at the supporting documents for the cross-sector mitigation committee. They are, um, I, I haven't been, um, I haven't watched their recent committee meetings, but I have looked at some of those documents because they're, they're, their task leads are starting to put together mitigation strategies and policies. And so they have draft um, drafts uh, available now on the AOA website. Um, so if you click on supporting documents, um, well, actually it looks like Marion might have put a consolidated uh, version in a link to that. Um, so thank you, Marion, in the chat. And so it might be worth taking a look at that. And I'm sure members of the cross-sector mitigation would um, appreciate feedback from other subcommittees as well. Um, just like just like us, they're challenged to, you know, go away from the committee and whoever might be available to do some work is doing some work and um, and then coming back to the committee for feedback. And so I think to round it out, having more subcommittee members uh, or more, just more input on the strategies, uh, it will be valuable. So. So um, that was a brief run through through the tasks and updates. I, I do um, want to honor that I put in uh, in the agenda some time for public comment at the end. I'm not sure uh, if folks will have any other comment, uh, anybody that's left. I'm not seeing any. Do, does anybody else have anything they would like to add for today?
Hearing none, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Thank uh, staff and subcommittee members um, for being here. Thank you, Claire, for taking the minutes and uh, wish you all a very happy post 4th of July week evening. Bye.